Hey, folks, Lights, Camera, Assassin. From executive producers Bill Hader and Silicon Valley's Alec Berg, it's the new HBO comedy, Barry. Bill plays Barry, a depressed hitman who discovers a new passion for acting while on a job in Los Angeles. Barry struggles to balance the responsibilities of his chosen life with the pursuit of his dreams, misfiring along the way. With Henry Winkler, Stephen Root, and Sarah Goldberg, new episodes of Barry air Sundays at 10.30 p.m. only on HBO. Also, I want to remind you that Spotify is making life easy for podcast fans. You can stream this show and the rest of your favorite podcasts on your mobile device, desktop app, and smart speaker. Just use your mobile device or desktop to open the app, click on the browse channel, then click on the podcast section. Stay thoroughly entertained during your commute to work, your drive home, or that time in the day when you want to stop wondering if life has no meaning. That's why podcasts are great, and you can get them on Spotify. Spotify. All right, let's do this show. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucksters? What the fucking ears? Uh, what's happening? Well, I just almost belched. I just, you, you know, I, how, I couldn't get that out. I couldn't do that before I started. I couldn't. Had to happen right then. How's it going? I'm Mark Marin. This is my podcast, WTF. Welcome to it. Uh, I hope you're doing okay. Today is, this being Sunday, uh, you're probably listening to it on, on Monday or after because there'd be no way to hear it unless you were standing outside right now to hear it. Um, today is the first day of showing the house. They're showing the house today. People are going to come walk through. I had to, I got rid of all the stuff that people could take as what, what they might perceive as free souvenirs. But today's the day I got to, I got to leave here and get out of the way. There's a for sale sign stuck in the front yard now. Um, and uh, the reflection continues. Uh, you, you know, like, there's a lot of, did I do the right thing? Am I, you know, but I love the new house, man. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I love it, but it's not tucked away into the, into the little hills, you know, where it almost feels a uh, rustic up here. It's not that place, but this space is pretty amazing. And uh, you know what? I'm going to shut up about it. It's just, it, I'm starting to feel it. And it, it's about time because they're showing the house today. Uh, I have Sean Penn on the show to talk about his book because that's what, uh, he's talking about. You know, we talked about other stuff, but uh, we talked about the book, the new book, Bob Honey, Who Just Do Stuff, that comes out tomorrow. It was intense. I don't know what it was, I was expecting. I'm not sure I got it, but, uh, but you know, I watched him smoke a lot of cigarettes, and we had to, we, we engaged a bit uh, before, before Sean. My old pal Lynn Shelton is here to talk about her new movie. Uh, Lynn Shelton just directed a very sweet, tight a touching movie called Outside In, which comes out this Friday, March 30th, in select cities. Maybe yours was selected. I don't know, but it's a great movie with Edie Falco and the, uh, the, uh, the Duplass, the J Duplass. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a very touching movie. A unique story it takes place up in, uh, up in Washington. So it's gray and rainy a lot in the movie, which I like. But, uh, you know, Lynn and I go back, and uh, it's, it's nice to talk to her. Um, but I wanted to read this email up front here, uh, again, because I, I think, you know, what keeps sticking in my head lately about actors and directors I talk to and about creative people in general who are putting out narrative product, is that the right? Narrative content. Narrative art. No product, no content. You hope it does that. Content, no. Product, maybe. You gotta make a living. But anyways, the idea of, of narrative art is really, you know, it's all about storytelling. And you talk to people who act, you talk to people that direct, you talk to people that write. Obviously, it's storytelling. But actors, too, for some reason, it sort of sticks in my head that a lot of what they see their job as being is contributing to telling a story. And that means that we have to believe, as I do, 
that that stories have a profound effect on people's lives, whether they're personal stories, life stories, uh, uh, fantastic stories, stories that are completely uh, pulled out of imagination, fantasy, whatever it is, that storytelling is the continuity that that makes sense of life for people. Storytelling is the human m- means of communication, of of moving through generations, of moving through mythologies, of defining you know, what makes us human and also uh, exploring all the emotions and journeys and possibilities of, of, of what is good and bad about humans comes through storytelling. And I don't always, you know, fully take in the impact of this show uh, in terms of, of, of narrative and in terms of people's personal narratives. And I, you know, sometimes I get an email where I, I'm just sort of, yeah, blown away and, 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 you know, grateful that I can, you know, provide something for people, you know, whatever it is. This does a lot for me as well. What it does for me and through me, it, you know, also has an effect on, on others in, in, in a profound way. And this email just, you know, I get choked up, man. I, I get choked up, uh, sometimes at the reaction to this show. And I'll read this. The subject line is just how you saved my marriage. Hi, Mark. Spelled correctly, I might add. Thank you, Carolyn. I can't sleep, so I'm typing this on my iPhone next to my husband, who is snoring one decibel under, I should find a lawyer. I've wanted to thank you for quite some time for saving my husband and my marriage. I guess I didn't know how or thought my email would get lost in a massive pile of fan slash troll mail. I also thought if you never read it, I'd take it personally because that's how my brain works. My husband and I have been married for 10 years, happily occasionally, madly in love always. He wasn't particularly funny when I married him since my childhood sucked, and I'm hilarious. I just always assumed his picture-perfect childhood fucked him in the long run. When we got married at 18, he joined the United States Marine Corps. I got pregnant. He went to Iraq. He made it home for delivery. Then we had a fat, happy baby. Two months later, he's going to Afghanistan. Unfortunately, he came back from Afghanistan hilarious and broken. The first year, I thought he didn't love me anymore. The second year, I realized that was wrong. He was no longer the man I met in high school, but a broken human, destroyed by human atrocities towards one another. The third year, every time I'd drive home, I'd hold my breath because I thought I was going to find him dead. I'd play on rewind, replay, repeat in my brain like the most heart-wrenching film ever caught on camera. I run in, yell, babe, then Johnny, there's never an answer. My mind would change what state he was in frequently. The end of year three, I started to see something different in him. He'd been driving long distances for work. I couldn't figure it out. He wasn't healed, of course, but every once in a while his eyes would show life again, just a glimmer. One day he came home smiling, a smile I hadn't seen in years. He started telling, almost yelling with a smile ear to ear about this comedian and his cats. I was giggling and I asked him where I can hear this guy. His response was, what the fuck, podcast. For the next few years to come, he walked in the door and I knew every time, bang, bang, bada, lock the gates had been part of the day. Your show makes the pain of war fall away from him. Your kindness and honesty... Gave my husband a reason to smile through the pain of being locked in his own mind. We saw you uh, at the comedy store recently. We sat front row. You put your feet up right in front of my husband. When I looked at you through his eyes that night, I understood you make it okay. He can be flawed and still a man. Damaged, but still loved and worth so much. I'll never be able to thank you enough for what you do for my family. Truly, Carolyn. Oh, God damn. Well, you're certainly welcome. We're sponsored today by Simply Safe Home Security, the company that's changing the way you keep your... Maybe I should come down a minute. Oh, my God. You know, I get, it's really moving to me and it's good. It's good. I, I don't connect like this, you know, a lot in life, you know, uh, where I'm talking to somebody and I can have tears rolling down my face, but, 
but Jesus, that email is, that was really something. And, you know, I, I, I'm happy to that, that this show does that. Believe me, believe me. I mean, you know, you, sometimes you go through life wondering if, if what you're doing has any impact and, or, or, you know, I do and I'm, and I'm happy it does and I'm happy it's good. Okay. Here we're going to try the, I'm going to try the ad again. We're sponsored today by Simply Safe Home Security, the company that's changing the way you keep yourself, your loved ones, and your belongings safe. And here's why I can get behind Simply Safe, because Simply Safe is ready for anything that gets thrown at it. If a storm takes out your power, Simply Safe is ready. If an intruder cuts your phone line, Simply Safe is ready. Let's say some jerk destroys your keypad or your siren, Simply Safe will still get you the help you need. They think of everything that could happen and they have a solution for it. Maybe it's overkill. Maybe you don't need to be ready for every worst case scenario, but that's the thing. Simply Safe is always ready just in case. Isn't that what you want? If you're paying for it, you want to know that every last detail is taken care of. And knowing that Simply Safe covers all the bases, you might assume that it's going to cost an arm and a leg. It should, but it doesn't. They charge what's fair, what's right. Fourteen ninety nine a month, no contracts, no hidden fees. The first time I did an ad for Simply Safe, my producer went right online and ordered a system for his home because it just made sense. And if you need home security, it should make sense for you. Go to simplysafe.com slash WTF. Check out all the security options they have to offer. That's simplysafe.com slash WTF. Okay. So Lynn Shelton, Lynn Shelton is a director. I've had her on this show years ago. We've been friends since. She's directed a few episodes of my show. She's directed a couple of episodes of Glow. I had her direct my, my, uh, my Netflix special, Too Real. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for her work and we're pals. So if the tone seems a little ball busty, as you know, uh, there are people in my life and people that have been on this show that I have a certain dynamic with and, uh, there's certain people I can just make laugh a fuck of a lot. And sometimes it's in a ball busting kind of tone, but just know that, uh, it is all in good fun. Lynn and I are definitely pals. Okay. All right. So this is uh, me talking to Lynn Shelton about her new film outside in, which comes out this Friday, March 30th in select cities. And, uh, perhaps your city, uh, has been selected and you get the joy of watching this movie. This is me and Lynn Shelton. <laughs> Okay, so why don't you, I'm going to act like this is the beginning of a conversation, okay. and we haven't, you, you didn't just say to me, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to pretend that that didn't happen, and I'm going to just start from there and say, well, why don't you tell me, Lynn, how do you, how, how do you make a, a small independent film like your most recent film, Outside In, with Edie Falco <laughs> and Jay Duplass? Hmm. How does it work? And and I liked the movie. I liked it. I got choked up. It was a nice moving story. You shot, uh, you know, that rainy, damp, moss-covered Washington. Well, I went to a screening. Pay your ten- pay attention. Don't play with the toys. What are you, Jennifer Lawrence? <laughs> Fucking touching everything on my desk. Come on, you put this in, pr- and you're not supposed to do that. For, I, I think it's to- very... not many people go for the top. The top sort of really? a commitment. Yeah, they'll do. Th- and some people have rolled the dice. <laughs> But most people, yeah, they've looked at the hammer. <laughs> it's but most people go with the uh, squi- the squeeze, the the uh, exercise I'm not, business. I'm not. Very weak hands. This is. They, they usually, I can't believe nobody does the top. But they, you got to sit and watch a top. Usually, people. It's very f- quiet. They fidget. Not. They don't try to entertain themselves <laughs> while I'm talking to them. They fidget with things. They don't. They don't sit there and go like, "Wow, got to be something to do here," other than listen to this guy. <laughs> pester me all right okay pull it together so i went to a screening because you insisted that i see it like a film yes and i thought i thought that was both annoying and uh i knew you would <laughs> i didn't want you to watch it on your iphone or whatever i don't watch it on my phone Mm-hmm. i don't watch things on my phone i watch from you're talking about last year when i was on set and i was watching the sopranos on my phone because i had my computer mm-hmm. i would have watched it on my macbook mm-hmm. with the fancy Screen, mm-hmm. but no, I appreciated the fact that you wanted me to see it as a movie, and I did. Thank you. I thought it was a good movie. I have some questions, but let's talk about it first. So, 
This movie is about a guy who gets out of prison with yep. the help of his high school teacher. Yeah. Because you find that he went into prison in, in a, in a, he was young and, and, and got caught up in something and was not guilty of the murder himself. Right. But, you know, but it doesn't start there. You don't even, you don't even go back there except for with sound effects. So he gets out and Edie Falco's a teacher and she's in a marriage. It's that guy who plays her husband. Could you, could you have picked like a more, like you wanted him to die oh, to, 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 to help himself out? Oh. It's like, it wasn't just about the marriage. It's like, this guy should just be put out of his own misery. He's just dying to sleep already. This sad motherfucker. Am I wrong? <laughs> he wasn't that pathetic. He's really into cars. Right, pretty sad though. It was pretty, pretty, pretty brutal. The marriage, for uh, unknown reasons, really. But, but my question is: so the story is basically this guy gets out, and the only friend he's got in the world is this woman, who is married and in an unhappy marriage, and uh, and he confuses all kinds of love with friendship and this and that, and you know. So, why do you think of this? Where does this come from? Um. I like to explore relationships between people who aren't supposed to, you know, I mean, we, we sort of have this list of people that we're supposed to be friends with or fall in love with right. or, and, and they should be in the same age range and, and they should be in the same sort of cultural, social milieu. Right. And, and so I like it when, that doesn't always happen as planned, that when people have a connection to each other, a genuine, intimate soul connection with each other across those boundaries. I think it's inspiring and liberating and um, not that this relationship is anything like that, but like one of my favorite movies growing up was Harold and Maude, and that was just so incredibly gorgeous uh -huh. to me right. because they were just, you know, crossing every boundary to to have that genuine relationship. Like I believed in the relationship, even though the, even though the movie is, you know, it's a little bit drenched in morbidity. Well, drenched in morbidity, but it's also kind of, you know, it's, 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 it's broad. It's not like super, right. You know, but, it, and yet I completely believed in this, in this relationship. And I just was in Harold and Maude. carried away by it. Yeah. And I'm not saying that Edie Falco and Jay Duplass are like Harold and Maude, you know, they have a little bit of an age difference. Yeah. It's not, but the, the main thing is the fact that they're, they're just from completely different circles and different places in their lives and different, and they're not supposed to, you're not supposed to have a connection. I mean, I did it with my last movie too. I was drawn to the script of laggies because a 16 year old and a 28 year old, you know, these are people are not supposed to be friends and yeah. they become genuine friends. And right. I think there's something really beautiful about that and, and liberating about just like doing something outside of the little box that you've been prescribed, you know? So, you know, that I, that was the relation uh, that I, that relationship. And also I loved the idea of, a of a sort of a very deep, intimate relationship developing over the course of 20 years. He was in 20 years. He was in jail for 20 years, yeah. prison for 20 years. Yeah. And they can't ever, I mean, they really fall in love with each other, but they can't ever touch. There's no physicality, you know, it's also all no, through letters. It's all through no risk in a way. R right. Like right. she couldn't have known what would happen. And I think that, you know, in her heart, her hearts, uh, in her heart of hearts, um, she probably wanted it to just go away. Well, I don't think she allowed herself to believe that. I mean, just out of self-protection, I think she just assumed he'd get out of prison and immediately just be carried away by all the young women around him his in age. That and shitty little town they're in? Well, you know, he had offers right away. <laughs> yeah, that was quick. That was very quick. <laughs> There's a scene where, like, clearly he hasn't had sex with anybody or had anybody but himself <laughs> touch him mm -hmm. in that place. Yes. And... uh I, I was impressed how quick it took. <laughs> but, whole, I mean, it's pretty believable though, I think. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it was, yeah. You made the movie. I mean, I would hope that you signed <laughs> off on it. You didn't go like, eh, leave it in. One of my favorite parts of that was that I had, um, a, a uh, the first AC yeah. is the, 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 um, assistant camera is 
responsible for focus. Right. And my first AC was meticulous, June Zendona. Uh huh. And she really, really hated when anything was ever out of focus. And I had to be explicit with her that I need, I need him to go out of focus. He's going to lean towards the camera <laughs> and I want him to go out of focus. Uh-huh. It was really hard, I think, for her uh-huh. <laughs> to let him like, but you know, I needed that moment. But I think this movie from the ones I've seen mm-hmm. is, uh, I think it's the most, uh, um, kind of, Emotionally mature one. Well, it's also, I have to say, I got on set and I felt like, oh my God, I'm, I, I feel like I actually know what I'm doing. I mean, not that I didn't oh, yeah. know what I was doing for six years, for right. those six films, but I've been on set almost constantly because of all the television I've done in those four years yeah. in between those two films. And I learned, I've learned so much. Right. And I didn't really realize it until how much until I gotten on, uh, until I finally got on the set of this film because, um, yeah, I just, I felt like I was bringing so much more, um, somehow to the. And you've gotten older. I've got, I have. That is true. And thank you, you know, for pointing that out. There's been like, you know, <laughs> you've gotten wiser. Wiser. Yes. I would hope so. <laughs> and, you know, there's new things in your mind. <laughs> yeah. It's my first drama too, which was really fun because I never thought I would make a drama. Um, I, yeah, it's not funny. I just, it's really not. Sorry about that. I'm not sure there, I'm trying to think if there's one funny beat in it. There, there is. Oh, hold on. Uh, oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's a couple. There's a few. Yeah. So now this movie's done. It's in the can. Uh, I, is it all done? Yeah. It, it, uh, had its world premiere back, way back in September at the Toronto International Film Festival. It's going to be at the South by Southwest Festival and then it'll be in theaters. Really? Yeah. In movie theaters? Mm hmm. It'll be in New York and LA and a few other places. So, on- so festival, no festivals. You've got a distribution deal. You don't need festivals. Well, we're going to South by Southwest. Right. But that sounds week. like just a, it's not a jury thing or anything. You don't need a deal. You don't need to right. be picked it's up. It's been sold. You're just, it you're has. just showing the people. We're showing the people. It got sold because of the Duplass machine. Yeah. Duplass has sold it. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. They Cause sure they do did. that kind of stuff. That's they act, they, they sell, <laughs> they, they, they do produce, it all. they direct. A little ridiculous. Yeah. They have children. <laughs> Somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah. They've got kids. It's, a, it's, it's the Duplass <laughs> empire. It's a lot of control. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're probably, they're there's probably unstoppable. a Duplass right outside right now. Just probably. standing there. Looking all cute and unassuming. Ruffled hair. Yeah. Yeah. But behind that, just looking to take over the entire show business industry. I'm just concerned about a a cultural duplassing that not unlike, you know, how we were Mumforded many years ago (laughs) that, and look what happened to the Mumfords. We're going to be duplass. What what did happen to the Mumfords? Exactly. I've not, I've not heard about the Mumfords in a while. Now, I don't want that to happen to the Duplasses. Oh, that's very, yeah. that's very caring of you. Yeah, we have to, we have to take Duplassing down to that 70%. Mm-hmm. 70% for, Duplass. Just for their own good. Yeah, drop it down 27% less Duplass in, in culture. That's all. <laughs> for some reason, my computer just went down. Are you serious? No, I was just talking about the power oh. of Duplass. <laughs> that they're, <laughs> that they're listening. I knew they were, Bigger than we thought. Oh my god, you hear that? I think it's a paddy wagon. <laughs> the Duplass. <laughs> the Duplass police are here. <laughs> so, alright, so it's gonna open in theaters, and like you did a lot of TV, you directed some glow. Mm, I did. You directed do you remem- me. Do you remember me? <laughs> yeah, I like working with you. You're a good actor's director. Thanks, um, Mark. I like how you, you know, instead of publicly giving notes, you, you come up. And you say, do you, um, maybe do it this way. And then I have that moment where I'm like, okay. My first reaction is always like, what? <clears throat> like, it's all, like, I know that, you know, I'm perfectly, I'm good at uh, working with other people now. And you, I know it's a good note. You're really different this season and than I can you were take notes. ever before. Really? Oh, yeah. And when I worked with you on Marin. Yeah. Um, the first two episodes it's of gonna season It's going to be the best four. part of the interview. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you, every time I gave you a note, you would it, get very defensive and immediately push back every single time. Really? Oh, yeah. And. I, that doesn't sound like me. 
<laughs> and then, and then you would take it and you would be, and you'd take be the better. adjustment yeah. and it'd be better. Right. And every that time, taught, that so taught me I how just, to adjust. I stopped. What? That's what taught me how to adjust. Yeah. I have to, I have to first do things under duress. <laughs> And then, you know, realize that, oh, it's not a bad thing. Like, this is going to be terrible. Oh, it worked better. Oh, that worked better. Yeah. And then, yeah, so you sort of could see the, the trust building. And then at the end of that process, you said, you told me that I knew funny. And I think you trusted me more. And then and then we got in Glow the first season. You still right. were doing it a little bit, but a little bit less. And then the second season, you you were, like, sometimes you would actually just say, okay, yeah. Which was, what? What did you just say to me? Well, I was enjoying acting. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that because I'm an actor. I can adjust that. I'll yeah. just tweak that Having a little deal. bit. Sure. What yeah. do you want me to do with that? Yeah, let's do that. Sometimes you'd argue, but... Um, I don't always know because... That was okay. Like, my Phew. choices are based on memorization and reacting to, to the other character, right? So like, I got the lines and I'm reacting. So uh, sometimes I make clear choices, mm -hmm. but other times there's not uh, a lot of emotional... Um, like it's all one sort of a mammity thing or something. Yeah, kind of. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, just tell me what to do, mm -hmm. and I'll just open up the mm -hmm. the 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 well, the gasket. That's why I like to I really valve. like to direct you because you are you are open. I, I I you're adjustable. Like I feel I feel like my direction is useful. Yeah, you know. Sure, I, 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 I've I've grown to believe that you want the best for the uh, the thing you're directing. <laughs> you're not just trying to fuck with me personally. <laughs> let's let's see if I can make him do this. This would be good. We don't have to use it. Let's just see see if we can make him do just, this. Just out of sadism, <laughs> just because I have control. Yeah, I think uh, I think the second season of Glow. It's really good. What do you know about it? Because I've seen a bunch of them. You did? Of course. I, di I directed the first one. Yeah. I directed the sixth one. Yeah. And I, and I've seen some of the other cuts. It's 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 great. And I read all the scripts. It's a fantastic season. It's so good. I mean, I loved the first season. This one's even better because they really, you know, they're Get writing for the characters, everybody, yeah. and they really took the arcs places yeah. that are. Oh my god. What about me? So how great. am I? How am I? You're fantastic. Am I in a lot of them? You are. I know you have this weird feeling like you weren't actually in. The, but you, you, yes, you right. were very much. It's hard to know because, it. you know, you, you just, it's so spread out. I know. And they seem to be doing a lot of things without me. Well, the, <laughs> it seems like a lot of the scenes that you're not in, it's yeah. like, it's, it's either, you know, 14 women or, or then you're no, in there. It's with a lot, like it's a, a lot. I, yeah. I was, I was happy with it. There was, it was like, I couldn't tell if I had just gotten good at the character. I was, wasn't doing it anymore. I, I couldn't tell if I was getting good at it or I became it. See, I've told this, I've told you this before, but if you can't tell, it's usually a good sign, I think, because as an actor, well, th someone would have said something um, if they were like, "Dude, prob are you do, probably are you still or you doing or you would have just been fired?" Yeah, are you still doing the character? Or are we, what are we doing? What the hell's going on <laughs> yeah. here? He seems to just, Who is this guy? <laughs> yeah, seems to just be like the same guy I just had lunch with. Can we lean into it a little bit again? <laughs> what aren't the pants enough? I got the pants. All right, so. Good. Good job. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Good job on the movie. Uh, good job on the TV you've been directing. Uh, I know you did a commercial. Is that something you can do more of? How'd that feel for you, Lynn? That was, uh, that was an interesting experience, Mark. Did, um, but did, did you learn something? What did you learn, uh, from directing a commercial that you can apply to your toolbox, Lynn, for the people who are out there? We're working on being a director and they're like, you know, commercials, but I want to make art movies. Mm -hmm. So you directed a commercial. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. No shame in it. But did you do something on the commercial? Like, I remember you directed some show where you had to direct a car chase. That was a first. Mm -hmm. Right. So now you know how to direct a car chase if necessary and yes. a car accident. Yes. So what'd you learn on the commercial? The interesting thing about this commercial was it was, uh, it was six spots for, for eBay. And there were two, you know, there were, there were, there were different pairs of people. So there were 12 people yeah. in these six spots. They, there were, it was like, a, it was like two or three lines. I think it was three lines. In yeah. most of these. And it was just a little back and forth. It was, uh, I, I shot it very simply. Most, I was, I saw the whole thing playing out in a two shot, but we also had, you know, singles on each person. And then, uh, you know, we shot 
three of these. It, we shot three of these each day. So there were two days, three each day. Yeah. And we, once you set the cameras up, it wasn't, it just wasn't very complicated camera wise. So once we had the camera and lighting, we just sort of set the frame and then did 60 variations on these three lines. You know, we just tried absolutely every single variation on these little, there's just subtle, funny yeah, little right, lines. Right. And just every color, every under the rainbow. I mean, I'm usually somebody on a set of a television or a movie. Don't got that kind of time. It's like three or four takes. Right. That's what I got. Unless somebody is just really falling down on the job or I can't figure it out. And then it might be 10 takes because you can't, you know, the actor isn't like, you're just not getting what you need. But very rare. It's usually two, three, four takes. So this was so weird to just be doing these three lines again and again and again and again in the most tiny little different nuances. And some I uh, you know I do my own, but then I'd run back to Video Village. Where there'd be twenty five people there, and they'd be like, "We just wonder if maybe she should smile after the you know whatever." It, There's twenty five of them. It, it felt sort of felt like yeah. They uh, gave me a standing ovation from afterwards from the ad agency. <laughs> well, and from was, eBay. There was the ad agency, and there was eBay, and I think that was mostly it. Yeah, huh. yeah, that's a lot of people. I'm sure it wasn't really 25. That's how it felt. They gave you a standing ovation because they they were like, she's still chipper and doing her job. I don't know why. Well, they, we didn't, I've never experienced anything like it. They just we kept clapping, and I was like, "We didn't break this her." Is so sweet, but I've never is this surreal as well, well. I have to imagine most editors or most directors go into those situations, you know, barely hiding their shame. <laughs> oh, <laughs> to be doing unless they're commercial directors, and commercial directors like some of them are great. Some of them, I imagine, like I don't have a soul. I'm here to make money. I got a good eye. Let's make some money. Sure, I'll do it a hundred times. Whatever you want. Somebody was just telling me about a commercial that they were on where the 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 guy just yelled the entire time. The yelled director? At everybody, yeah. Just everybody. All he should have been yelling is, You think I wanted this? <laughs> you think this is my dream? You want to see some of my feature scripts? That was the subtext. Yes. Yeah. How about you want how about why don't I sit around and read my feature script? Smug little fuckers. Yeah, that's what's going on. Yeah, you don't do that. You don't yell. I haven't seen that yet. Yet. Not yet. We'll see. It's coming. Yeah, when you direct me in your movie. Mm -hmm. See how that goes. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, thank you. Congratulations on the film. It's nice to see you, as always. No, thank you, Mark. All right, Lynn. Okay, that was me, Lynn Shelton, for Movie Outside In, out this Friday, March 30th in Select Cities. So, okay, so now now we're talking to Sean Penn. Now, Sean Penn, obviously, is Sean Penn. There's a lot there. Uh, I was uh, a little intimidated to, to do the interview when it happened. I didn't know, you know where he was at or how you really cover it and what you can cover. But it seemed pretty clear that, you know, he's making a transition in his life and, uh, and he wanted to talk about this book, which I read. I, I literally read almost all of it, except for the last 10 pages, but I did read the very end. I, I, tr- I, I, you know, it was dense, man. It's a dense, not a, it's not a huge novel, but, uh, language wise, it's, um, you know, it, you know, it, you gotta go slow with it. But uh, I was able to talk to him about that uh, and about a few other things. And uh, I think he was very happy that I uh, I didn't have a problem with him smoking uh, seven cigarettes inside an hour. Uh, I actually liked it. I also want to remind you again that you can listen to this show and other podcasts on Spotify. Uh, now it's easier than ever. Just open the app on your mobile device or desktop, click on Browse, and then click on the podcast section. It works on your computer, your phone, your smart speaker system, whatever you want to use. So stay connected to your favorite podcast and never miss an episode using Spotify. Okay, so Sean Penn's debut novel, Bob Honey, Who Just Do Stuff, comes out tomorrow. Uh, and this is me talking to Sean Penn. How you doing, man? Very well. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see you. I, I feel like uh, we grew up together, but we didn't. And, uh, you know, just always part of my life. And there you are. Here I am. Sitting right there. <laughs> so, I, you know, the book is, is kind of a, it's a, it's a pretty a, a dense and astounding thing you did there. 
Oh, well, I'm going to appreciate that. <laughs> no, you should. I mean, because, you know, it's not a light read. It's not an easy read, but it's funny and, uh, and it's, uh, dark and, and it, it, it's referenced in all the right places in my mind. But when I started reading it, I immediately realized, like, I, I got to pay attention. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. It, yeah, that, that was to a degree by design. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, it reads like a, a very long prose poem, like a satirical prose poem interspersed with occasional Phil Oaks lyrics and uh, Lennon lyrics and then a massive epic poem of your own at the end. Mm-hmm. But it's all a poem, it seems. It, yeah, I think uh, that I was thinking of my thoughts more melodically than, than uh, lyrically. Yeah? yeah? And this is the first time you ever wrote this long form like this? Yeah. Yeah, it had been on my mind for a very long time, and uh, um, to well to write a book and and the character of the book certainly evolved over the years, and uh, you know it had not initially been, um, let's say, uh, a, a funny tale, mm-hmm. and then it seemed the only thing that I could put out there today might have to. At, at least have my sense of humor available, and, right? And, and 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 then see roll the dice with how that would a, a, appeal or not appeal to others. Well, the sense of humor is, you know, it's uh, you know, this is a character that is 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 kind of nebulous, but but seemingly familiar in its violence and uh, and and it's sort of uh, the way it moves through the world, uh, where the world is just happening to him, mm-hmm. and then you know the way he engages in the world through. Uh, you know, military means and violent means and murderous means and occasional charitable means and then somewhat uh, uh, sexually ambiguous at times. Uh, it, it, it's one of those characters. It's like um, the Confederacy of Dunces or some William Burroughs stuff where, you know, you realize that there's a lot more moving through this guy than, you know, knowing the guy. Right. Right. <laughs> Does right. that make sense? Yeah, very much so. <laughs> you know, and uh, and the humor of it for me is uh, is the humor of uh you know american violence yeah. in some weird way so where did you start the process of 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 doing this because it does seem like there's bits and pieces of your life events of your life that you that you move through this character yeah i well, you know i think that the first books i was offered to write yeah. started at about age 30 were memoirs mm-hmm. Which was always a kind of embarrassing notion to me and became at, at the height of an embarrassing notion when a colleague of about my age, and I'm not, no longer a young man, but I still somehow uh, if I find if a memoir is appealing, that it comes a little closer to the ant- anticipated end. Yeah. Um, as a smoker, perhaps <laughs> I should have written the memoir. But You might have time, man. I mean, <laughs> but no. what did occur to me after I read this book by... by a colleague of my own, my own age was was how funny it could be to you know to, in so many ways we rewrite the stories of our life anyway yeah and I in going back through and thinking out a memoir I and, and think it, suddenly I'd get things out of order I'd get things wrong it wouldn't make any sense yeah. for the year if this person were in this story or this dream and. So I thought, well, this is another part of a toolkit for uh, a, a a novel where I, of course, I'll use things, but I'll exaggerate them freely. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, 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 you know, um, uh, remember this in the spirit of them or the people that they, the real people that some of these characters represent. Yeah. Um, and I, I can, you know, figure out the words that are come to it as if I wanted to write a letter to them. Yeah. Um, and so I had that personal anchor going through it, but only as an anchor and, uh, and, and not only is it related to, and also because I had some knowledge of the areas where in the, in the style of this, everything that's real, um, it becomes the 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 punchline of 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 everything that's surreal around it. Right. Well, yeah. And there was just the the you know because now the character of Bob Honey. I mean, and you're because there there's bits of cultural criticism in here. That's why you know as a novel, you know, you have to pay attention because you're not giving necessarily uh, a lot of uh, a, um, uh, detail to. You're not spending a lot of time on the trees. Do you know what I mean? You know, you're spending a lot of time on the thoughts, on the moments, on, on, you know, what's being attacked and, and what's wrong, uh, and what is, um, 
you, you know, these like sort of in-depth, uh, you know, uh, uh, descriptions of, of military procedures and it's stuff like that. So there's all these layers going on. And, uh, but in it is a very severe and very relevant critique of what, what is happening now in America. I mean, that's, you know, it's very current. Right. Yeah, I mean, as much as anything, it was a reaction to the 2016 campaign. Yeah, and that, and I'm assuming by this, by the the chaos of this protagonist and what surrounds him, that uh, your your hope has been somewhat shattered. Well, yeah, <laughs> you know, this, it's funny. The timing of the book coming out is 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 interesting uh, in the sense of uh, I paid a lot of attention to the media coverage of the surviving kids of the parkland shooting yeah and it, it occurs to me that if those kids you know i'm quite certain that they that uh, when they it, when they'd cnn did their town hall yeah one of the things i most noticed was that this crucial issue at this incredibly sensitive moment where kids were on of their own volition wanting to stand and take it on within days of the horror that they'd experienced it might have served CNN and the world better not to interrupt it with a BMW commercial and maybe make an exception here. Yeah. And clearly the march is going to get coverage. After that, I would assume that, that there are many people and one in particular who will find ways to create bigger stories for the media to tell and that are more attractive at that point to the BMWs of the world to, to sponsor. Yeah. So where the where uh, where I find because the question circles around it from from your your original question about hope the the hope that I had going into this book was a, a fairly lonely one. Yeah. Now, if these kids and I do see that there's some activity, for example, the the founders of the Women's March yeah. have come in come in support of their march. Well, if if the, if that begins a kind of amalgamation of movements, uh, so that by the time of the election, the 2018 election, yeah. you have a real a coalition that isn't single issue focused, mm -hmm. that is really going to be out there to get a, a reasonable men and women in those positions mm -hmm. of of making laws, that there starts to be a little bit of hope. But the idea of what we're going to do to recalibrate after the damage of this administration, after what it's done. Already. Know, already. It does start, you know, I had had an idea, which I expressed to the Clinton campaign at the time, uh, that, that they might consider somebody like um, uh, John Kasich as a running mate. Right. And I think that <clears throat> the possibility, I mean, I could easily see someone like Kamala Harris yeah. running with somebody like Jeff Flake, mm -hmm. where it isn't about agreement on policy. It's agreement on being dignified human beings and to bring to understand the political import of that dignity because we've fallen so clearly fall far. Yeah. And I, in, in, in you feel that in the book, you feel like, you know, you, your, your emotional weariness and, and sort of um, patriotic heartbreak of of you know just the the distracting and entertaining chaos that culture has become and the inability to focus on really anything see it's one of those books where you know the through line is this character who 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 acts in a subversive world of uh you know god knows what whether it's septic tanks or mallet murdering or or whatever that the undercurrent of american culture the hypocrisy of it has always been these movements in these dark worlds and then the rest is just you know glitter and garbage right so you know in in light of that and in light of the 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 the, the large poem at the end you know i felt uh I, I felt like, cause I can't help but uh, not separate the writer from the book. I, I, I thought like, well, well, I hope Sean is, you know, not defeated here. <laughs> well, it was an exercise in avoiding defeat in the sense yeah. that when I was reading newspapers, when I was in, um, barroom conversations, when I was watching television, I saw, I, I saw that my whole engagement was in the struggle and, and, and it, it the struggle to not be defeated. Yeah, well, it, personally, in the in, in the offense that yeah. that the media reporting and what it was having to report 
had was doing on a daily basis to my mind, body, and spirit. Right. Yeah, yeah. So in going to the other room and writing and making a kind of play world of it, uh, where let's say it's kind of operating room humor. Right. Uh, because I felt like a surgeon whose patient was inevitably going to die every day. And I thought, well, let, let me, let me go practice this in an alternate reality form, which yeah. it got me away from the news for a while. Well, that, that, that's beautiful. That's perfect. Like, cause there are lines in here where, like, there's a precision to your personal, what I'm assuming is your personal experience of what you're describing when you say less a political or cultural crisis than a cataclysmic crisis of the country's mental health. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So you got to isolate yourself to see that clearly. Well, yes. <laughs> and also to include myself in the problem. Right. And how, in, in, so, like, in what way do you see that? What way do you feel that? In, in terms of in complicity through through apathy, because you're not particularly apathetic, or just the the fact that you don't feel like you're doing enough, or that you've made movies you don't like. I think the the the, uh, the poet laureate of India had had a there was a line I I learned about from a wall a, a graffiti wall in yeah. Omaha, Nebraska, about thirty <laughs> years ago. Yeah. And it said, "Every new child born is proof that God is not yet discouraged of man." Uh-huh. And I think that in this book and in this character, the idea is that he is to, trying to rediscover the innocence that is necessary to carry on as, as an adult. In other words, to go outside and notice the leaf that falls from the tree. Mm-hmm. And when we get too involved in the culture of complaint, we start living only the complaint. So the culture of complaint is the the sort of uh, the flag of the culture of entitlement. Yes, and 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 we are certainly suffering from our entitlement because whether those are in that minority but strong core that support the policies and the person mm-hmm. or this person, this celebrity yeah. of a president, uh, be it be it that part of the illness. Or ours, as we fight against it, or when our when our entire lives are occupied with the struggle, we forget about the lives, right? And and we certainly forget about the lives that aren't white and American. Mm-hmm. And so, when we see some of these movements, and I and I certainly do not include uh, this recent bold. Brave, articulate reaction from these kids in Parkland. They're they're coming into a move, the, 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 the dealing with assault weapons yeah. in American streets um, is one of those things that you, yes, I can see fighting that fight every day. But uh, but so many of these other movements and proportionality to other things and other places strike such a chord of hypocrisy because they 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 are uh, movements that will ultimately have been considered a fashion. Uh-huh. And we've seen that happen before. And I was always wary of movements as a child of the 60s. I saw, you know, I, I loved from afar, you know, the kind of anti-war movement yep. of the and the hippies and uh, everything. Well, we were young. Yeah. But, but when, when that yeah. turned to calling soldiers baby killers, uh-huh. I thought, wow, I'm glad I was never... Uh, I wasn't old enough to be, but I would. Uh, I, I'm glad I wasn't old enough to have done what I would have done, which is aligned with that movement. And so it's really me kind of crying out for people to find a social we and a a personal I, um, because the the identification, the I now, yeah. seems only to exist either through advertising. Or, or, or movements and packs and, and courage is a, is a pack mentality and redefined. And in many cases, we talk about victims synonymously with heroes, which just doesn't make sense in the English language. Yeah. Well, the, the, the idea that the uh, courage, uh, the, the, this, the, the fine line in courage and movements and, and, and actual mob mentality. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thin line. Well, again, it really yeah. depends on how you get up, not yeah. how you fall down or who, or who pushed you down. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's unique to these, this, this kids movement out of Florida 
is that they are not looking for a fight. They seem to be so respectful of all sides, understanding of, of, of all sides, and approaching this with a kind of insight that only someone who is a teenager coming under that kind of extraordinarily loud, harsh, violent fire, seeing the devastating injuries, uh, mortal and not, around them, fatal and not around them, of their friends, that they have come out not as a, not dominated by anger, but dominated by reason. Yeah, like they're killing us. And, 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 and a real understanding of what America was born to be in, in its ideal, mm-hmm. in its constitutional ideal, in its Declaration of Independence ideal, the Founding Fathers ideal. They're, they are a movement of a democratic society, not a movement of personal identity. Uh huh. And then you, so in terms of the hippies, you know, once it, it got to that point where they were criticizing, uh, the military, and then, you know, once it, it got to the point where, you know, they were being shot in the streets and then sort of were easily appropriated by commercialization and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, moved on to other things. There was not enough s- structure to the movement. No, yeah. that, and, uh, you know, God knows there, they had an accomplishment. I think they, they did. Sure. Played a sure. Large role in ending the war, but it may, Phil Oaks, who I quote a lot in the book. A lot of Phil Oaks in the book. He, he always kept his hair short and wore a suit. Yeah. And he said why. It was, he was, he would tell his colleagues in the anti-war movement with their long hair and beards, um, you know, if this country has a choice between a bunch of long hairs taking drugs yeah. and Richard Nixon, they're going to choose Richard Nixon. And, uh, but he was a voice in the wilderness uh-huh. to a large degree. So you like that practical approach? I, I think that the, if we, if we say we care about our kids, yeah. results matter. Right. And maybe say, you know, how can we do that? And it's going to be compromise, and a lot of your ideals are going to be offended. And, you know, when it gets down to the real conversation, there are people who in their hearts disagree with us. Yeah. And that's what having a democratic system is all about. Right, and and bridging that gap between those hearts is no, it's no small task. Right. Now, when, you know, in the, in the final poem, and, and I, I assume what you're kind of referring to right now, uh, in terms of, cause you were, you, you seem to be supportive of a, of a, uh, an active and, and r- real coalition between the, the women's movement and, and these kids around guns. But there, there are obviously factions within the women's movement that are causing you some stress. Oh, most definitely there are. And I think more importantly, I think they're causing themselves some harm. Mm hmm. In terms of the long term, the sustainability of the rational movement, the rational cultural change that has to happen, and frankly, until there's a uh, it, to in my, to my mind, yeah. While I will be accused of metabolizing on behalf of women or what whatever that, that, that the, the various texts are, because entering the conversation is uh, it, with with nuances is, is to. Um, a- agree to be social media uh, uh-huh. to death. Yeah. Um, Quick baited to death. Yeah. I think the his- history tells us that in these things, because of what, how much of this is human nature that has to um, less be judged than, than contained mm. uh, because it will continue to exist as a nature. Yeah. Uh, artifacts of, what we have been at other at less evolved times, and if they want a, a, an evolution, that uh, the, then the revolution is going to have to understand that there's a thing called baby steps. That they're the only ways that these things le- move forward. A conversation. It's got to be a conversation, and and you can't fall into the trap. Movements, whether it's the women's movement, the Me Too movement, all of this, I worry that they fall into the trap at large. That they fall into the trap. Of becoming the enemy, which is Trump, they become they they're using the social media in a similar way. Many of them are, uh, and there is an increasing divide where there is less and less any we available, mm. and it and it and like we were talking before, if we don't balance our lives between the I and the we, 
um, we don't move forward. We continue to move back. Well, I mean, you, you actually, when you say normalization of commercial compromise had left this medium as one of the dominantly irrelevant fantasies, adding nothing to the world and instead providing a perfect storm of merchanteering thespians and image builders now less identifiable as creators of valued product than of products built for significant sales. These masses of fans as happy as hustled, bustled, and rustled cheap. A country without culture, nothing more than a shopping mall with a flag. Still, business is branding buoyantly, leaving Bob to yet another bout of that old society is sinking sensation. Now, that you, you, speaking of you know the, what the divide and conquer of commercialization has done is that you know I don't know that people can see the difference between uh, a we and a me, and that me is we, and that uh, if you don't sort of get on board with it, you have moments of uh, agreement, but it's still fundamentally selfish because we've all been uh, you know deemed a unique individual, entitled people that can brand ourselves as we uh, are in, uh, are able to do through whatever identifying products. So. And you're, you know, you're talking about show business <laughs> and you're talking about the death of art and you're talking about, uh, the death of anything sort of relevant that, uh, that this industry, uh, you know, puts out. Mm-hmm. Right. But you, like, you know, now that you're writing a book, you know, with it, is a more difficult sale and more difficult market than films. I mean, how do you feel in terms of your ability to express, you know, what you want to put out into the world as an artist with the book as opposed to, let's not start with acting, but your own films. I got, I, I, the way I always describe this, my relationship with films is sort of like the in the 1970s, the girl I fell in love with uh, was a movie theater with strangers in it in the dark uh, where often the biggest films of the day were also the best films of the day. Mm-hmm. And where you often had an experience, we often had an experience as an audience, where after 10 minutes of, of a film, you knew that 40 years later, if you ran into one of those strangers somewhere, and it came up that you'd both seen that movie, you'd both remember. Yeah everything about that movie Mm -hmm. and how it affected your life and what you were doing at the time. It was, in a simple word, a special experience and a special offering from the filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Even a great movie today is almost in an impossible position to represent that in our culture. There's so much content. Mm -hmm. There's so much noise. There's so much um, competition for... Uh, being part of the conversation. Yeah. Everybody w- is being told what to talk about. Yeah. And if it's a film, it's going to, la- that conversation might, might on, a, on a good day last two weeks. And that's mostly going to be about the Cirque du Soleil event of whatever the big, big bang genre film yeah. was. And most yeah. content going to television or people watching it, uh, live streaming or breaking it into episodes or where, where, where no longer do you have a church of, of, storytelling mm-hmm. but you have you know everybody's a uh, cubicle right and with a lot of choices with a lot of choices and a lot <laughs> yeah. of separation between That's us right. on this stuff. right yeah so w- while i can't claim being from that generation that i i, I would uh, assume that there's not something special to be found within it that it's not just like uh transactional uh romances yeah um I can't get a grip on it. I can't understand how to find or feel that I'm sharing. You can see something special and still not know that I've got a we around me on that feeling like I used to. Well, yeah, because it's a, it, like the, the landscape has become, you know, completely, uh, you know, fragmented and all of these different portals. Like I, yeah. I, I, sometimes I think like, you know, back when there was three networks and one public TV station, uh, you know, we weren't getting all the information, but we were on the same page, give or take culturally. Yeah. Yeah, and when and now even you know pick your favorite news station to watch, and mostly I'm wondering why anchors, some of whom I've I have great respect for, rather than reporting the news, it seems they should be pulling a fire alarm. Right. That this is that we are at the Paddy Chayefsky moment. You know, yeah. And, and 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 beyond it, yeah. actually beyond it, and so I'm writing a book. Which, which one? I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. 
And in writing a book, I think, you know, I don't, A, I have the blissful ignorance of, of the book publishing world. Mm-hmm. I don't know as we sit here what, what a lot of books is. How, well, you know, somebody tells me, hey, it sold this many. I don't know what that means yeah, relative right. to the, the world of that. I'm going to keep myself a little blind to that. Yeah. But what I do know is that if you pick up a book and hold it in your hand yeah. and read it, however many people do, that's a, or, or, there's a sort of guaranteed special in that. Yeah. It's, it's a specialness. Like, like to that person, I got to write not an email, right. but a letter. Right. And they read the letter. They'll remember that letter mm-hmm. if they read it cover to cover. So it's it slows things down somehow. It's not part of the noise. Yeah. And you know, I wondered what it would be like talking about it, and 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 the irony of selling something in essence, which is really for me, you know, genuinely wanting to participate in the conversation with anybody who's willing to hear it. When I put the book out the first time, I did an audible version of a short version of it. Yeah. And I didn't like that because that was, I didn't like it read to people. I wanted it, I wanted people to find the voice themselves. Uh-huh. And I didn't like my performance of it either. So when I went and, 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 and novelized it, it felt so good just knowing that I was going to, you know, put that in an envelope and, and, uh, you know, like a, like a message in a bottle. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Then put it out in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's exciting. A, a, but do you find, you know, they, it's a, it's a lonesome task and, you know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of refining. And I, I imagine you had, uh, uh, you know, good friends helping you and editors helping you in terms of, you know, refining things. Well, the way that I, I that, that it worked is that I, that while I say that I didn't want people to have it read to them. Yeah. I would abuse the hell out of my very good friends who I would say after I wrote another 10 pages, sit down and I would, yeah. and it would be helpful to read it aloud oh, for, yeah. to continue writing. Oh, that's great. And so that was one of the process. Then what happened is, uh, when I, when, uh, Atria Simon and Schuster took it, yeah. Peter Borland was my editor and I had never worked, of course, with a, or an editor on that way. I had as a journalist, but I hadn't worked with an editor in, in fiction. And what I had done is I had written screenplays and had too many, too many opinions around that didn't understand the screenplay. What I found very quickly in this instance, and it may be the book world and it may be that I just found a really good editor, was suddenly somebody was only ever speaking to the book as I'd written it and, and understood it uh-huh. and would say things like, um, I, 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 uh, give me more geology, uh-huh. <laughs> or I'm not this part. I, d- I don't understand this. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to, if you're okay with letting me understand it, I'd like you to write it, uh, work on it, and ma- help me understand it. Uh-huh. I think it'll tell your story better. And it was so encouraging and productive an experience. And we would only talk, you know, a, every couple of weeks. And, as, and, as and as a I new creative training. relationship for you, really. Yeah, that really kind of carried it. Um, you know, to a place where I felt that I had as much as you ever would with anything creative that I'd completed it. I think I, I don't know if I would have known how to complete the task without the trust that he had in the material Mm -hmm. that I needed to know someone other than I had Mm -hmm. that I didn't, it it wasn't me that told him what this meant and he knew what it meant. (laughs) And then with that, I became very trusting of him, mm-hmm. and so it was. That was just a great uh, uh, compliment to the whole experience that this was for me doing that. New creative experience is great, and you, you know it's interesting. We talk about like I, I don't know how old are you? How old are you? Fifty seven. So I'm fifty four. You know, and I remember you know most of your movies. You know, because you know we're around the same age. So, it, it in in hearing you talk about you know. The fragmentation of, of media and, and getting people on the same page, the conversation, the we and all that. I mean, you finding yourself nostalgic, uh, you know, because you were the, you were the, you bridged the gap between the seventies that you, you know, remember and we romanticized to some degree and the actors of that generation and directors of that generation, you know, to wherever we are now. I mean, you were the next guy 
And it seems like you had a real relationship with a lot of those guys whose movies you revered. Mm-hmm. I had Nolte in here. In, oh, in, yeah. <laughs> he, and, and I got him on a good day, I think. He found he, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he just, you know, he's, it, it, there are guys like him, and I've also talked to Elliot Gould, oddly, where you, you start a conversation in the middle of one they're already having. Right. You know, and, you know, he was talking about, you know, some time where you invited him to Brando's house. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, but, you know, th- there was, like, I have to assume in, in your, your journey of creativity that having been able to spend time with those guys in some of the directors you work with had to have a pro- profound effect on how you approach almost everything. No question. Yeah. Y- yeah. And, and when you use Nicholson in your own films for a couple of times, and then David Morris, too, who you seem to like a lot. Yeah, wonderful actor. Great actor. But that, you know, you're sort of honoring a, a legacy. And, and, and are you, is there heartbreak involved in what you, I would think, would see as the passing of some sort of time, an era? The, you know, the, the, my answer is yes. And I guess it's part of living into one's 50s, in my case, when it happened, where, yeah, I, 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 I was part of the, you know, pseudo intellectual argument that this was coming, that it was happening, uh, that we were falling down as an industry, that we had too many of our colleagues who were more interested in selling movies than making them, that things were contrived, that there was a kind of self censorship and a brainwash. The value system of my colleagues changed into one of what I talk about in the book, which was kind of self branding and, yeah. and, and, and Google alerting oneself, which is like mainlining uh, this disease of celebrity. And what we finally came to, what I came to in my experience of it was, yes, a, a, a final heartbreak. But in that heartbreak, I'm not with that girl anymore. And you suddenly, after like any after any heartbreak, that girl being movies, yeah, and uh, and and what the nostalgia was. Once you know, one morning you get up and it's a new day, uh-huh. and then there's a new girl to fall in love with. And for me, that was writing this book, right. No, I, I get that. But, but like, you know, having, having, you know, sort of talked to more actors lately about acting, right? You know, and knowing, you know, bits and pieces of, you know, the life you've lived off screen, which is, you know, a, a ballsy sort of, you know, risk taking life of different things, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, political or, or showing up to help people in, in, in dire circumstances or pushing the envelope. Uh, you know, with your own creativity and your own life, you know, trouble and crisis and everything else that somehow or another, when you were coming over here, you know, I, I thought that was, you know, I was intimidated at first because I don't know you and, you know, I know your movies, right? So the question, my point is, you know, when I talk to somebody like Nolte or, or if I talk to, you know, I talked to Jennifer Lawrence recently, I talked to Sharon Stone last week, is that the, the, the actors like yourself who, you know, can somehow you know, find, you know, the humanity and empathy uh, uh, that's available in the characters you play, the vulnerability there, that, you know, whether or not a million people or 10 million people are watching a movie or whatever, once you enter that level of storytelling where, where the human story is being told through your feelings, like, you know, in Milk or in any of them, you know, uh, you know in Mystic River even, that guy had a humanity, right? So do you, do you really want to walk away from that or are you just kind of waiting for the next thing i think it's possible that you know it's a word that's used probably too often when we think of others labeling us yeah but in the way we label ourselves i think i've i've productively from it from my sense of it blurred the lines so that in my experience of what I've been doing and trying to do that at one time would have been called acting in movies, I am still doing it. Yeah. It's just, I ch- it's just adapting the, the form in, in which I do it. So I'm made of paper. Yeah. The character I want to play is made of paper uh-huh. and it has words on it. Uh-huh. And, so I don't, so, so no longer, I, I remember loving that girl that I, was making movies, but I no longer have any interest in making movies. I have no interest in seeing movies. It's just not 
I can't, and there are, I get, I do it sometimes because I have a friend who's very talented. I just saw what should be a disaster. I saw a remake, the third remake of A Star is Born. Yeah. Uh, written by Eric Roth and Bradley Cooper, I believe, who directed it and starred in it himself. And if I could do that today, what he did with that story, uh huh. I'd be staying in the game, but I don't have the perspective and maybe not the skill sets. This is one of the most beautiful, fantastic, it's the best, the most important commercial film I've seen in so many years. Who's the female lead? Lady Gaga. Uh huh. And I'm telling you, the two of them are m- miracles in it. And so, it isn't dead. I believe, you know, I, I will be heartbroken if the world, including people who would loathe me, because it's one of those films I feel like you don't have to be, if you're a very, if someone's very intelligent, yeah, they're going to love this film. If somebody is not very intelligent, they're going to love, there's a big we maker in this thing. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and I'll be heartbroken for that film if it doesn't, doesn't go through. Even if I ever have any small version of feeling like I could create something like that in this climate, I really believe it's going to be on paper. Huh. Yeah. I mean, is it because, you know, m- making movies involves too many other people? <laughs> For me, it is. Yeah. I mean, I think if I had an, if I have a next volume of this book, yeah. it will be probably titled Mr. Honey Does Not Play Well with Others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, it's. I, I mean, I, I guess, like, I, I, I feel what you're saying, and I hear what you're saying, and, and I, and I don't want to stop uh, talking about it quite yet. But, y- y- you know, in in looking at some of the work you've done and the people you've worked with, I mean, don't you still find that, you know, y- you were a, a great facilitator of the we conversation? And I, I, I do think it was my best strength in terms of as a collaborator with yeah. actors and directors and so on. It's come not to be, and I don't think that that's, uh, I think it's, it, it, it's the evolution of, of, of my experience, some of which was, was based on great disappointments, some of which was based on, you know, a fatigue. But when I came out of the disappointments and out of the fatigue, I remembered, uh, in the book, um, uh, Coetzee's book, I think, Disgrace, the opening has something to do with the greatest sin a man can commit is to deny his own nature. It, as it turns out, yeah. my nature now wants to be creatively alone, socially together, but creatively alone in the in the creation of of, of something. Uh-huh. Um, I I I'm working on a, a a thing now that I which I don't think I'll do again with great people. I've been working on a thing in New Orleans, great people, and of course because I'm being paid well because uh, I'm honored to be part of something with smart people who care a lot. I don't let myself hurry the day and give up on the discovery necessary, whether for my own performance or what the director's trying to do or, or noticing where one could be helpful to another actor. But it's work. It didn't used to be. It used to be fun. It's work to not want to just get the hell home to my dog. <laughs> and I don't feel responsible <laughs> staying in that. When I'm writing... Yeah. It ain't work. Huh. It's, I, you know, I don't dance. Some people go out and dance and yeah. get their spirit filled. Yeah, um, nobody would want to see me dance. Uh, most, least of all myself. But it feels like dancing, the writing. And so I, I just find this is where I, you know, there was no, there was no law saying that because this is what I, I've been a quote unquote actor for all these years that, you know, that, and that, a director and director that film, has to be well because I, I left out director because i I have one film that i I think I'd like to make uh if I make another film as a director as an actor i i i I realize on the job that I'm doing that when I get to the last day of this shoot i I can uh, let myself functionally not give a shit uh right now I can't because I got to finish working hard and kind of keep my head in the wind. But I'm a couple of weeks away from that, and uh, and and the the idea of being free to just uh, live a writer's life with a, my a golden retriever sitting there, yeah, it would be a dream come true. And there's no sadness in that. 
Not anymore. No, not anymore. And 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 I and I accept that I may be blind to a lot of the values of where the business and is going. You know, it's it was never a decommercialized business. Of course, we told ourselves it was. We we didn't. You know, as a young actor, I wouldn't have thought that the two hour film format was designed by the theater owners. You know, or, yeah. or whatever it is. And God knows, I understand that. When people, you know, we always consider reading of books as a pure form of, of, of absorbing culture. But actually, when they do these binge watches of shows and they, they may, maybe one night they read a chapter and maybe they decide to put it back down, go live a little life with their friends. Then maybe the Smiths and the Joneses come over the next day and yeah. you a book club and you read together. Yeah. And, and so in some ways the experience, this is a conversation I'd had with Warren Beatty. And I may well be stealing some of his words as I do from his conversation about this subject. Uh, but it really articulated it as I had been feeling it where, you, you know, I am not able to, exp- to find the, the, the joy in it, but I'm sure it's there for many people. So, in acting and directing. In, in film. Film. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's hurting me, Sean. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Nobody said this was going to be easy. <laughs> but it, but and, and you you you're convinced this isn't a phase. Well, I I, I want to be clear that I can you know as an audience. Yeah. If someone corners me in a room and something like a star is born happens, I I can weep in joy. I mean, I'm still available to the magic of this thing. Right. But to just admire a film alone. And, you know, I I was also very grateful at the, some years ago at the reception to The Revenant, which I was worried about because I thought it a masterpiece and I also thought it too hard for the, the, the contemporary audience. And yet it, it came through because of the stellar work that the of the filmmaker and the actors. This one, though, is a really because it's about the essential, which is love. I mean, it's it is, and because it's, um, you know, it's it. It's an acknowledgement of something. If, if it has one thing going against it, it's the question of whether people are going to be honest enough these days in this kind of overstructured, politically correct, uh, you know, common wisdom. Uh, are they ready to see love be a mess? Yeah. <laughs> um, because I, you know, not only speaking for myself, but the, the, the best relationships I've ever seen were a mess. And, uh, and there's something beautiful about the, the flaws and things that's never going to go away. We're going to focus so much attention on on our hand, forgetting that our elbow could be the thing that gets broken. And, you know, it's always going to come in a way we don't expect. And that's kind of the beauty of it. And that's the beauty of this film. So because we've spent so much time talking about the things that I, you know, mourn the loss of, it's really more of a personal conversation about where I feel I can be productive, where, yeah. I, where I feel excited about sharing things. Because even if it's a very unique situation where an A Star is Born can be made, I think it, I'm like promoting it. It comes out in October. Because I, <laughs> I, I saw it three times and I just, you know, kind of wept all the way through the damn thing. And you laugh your ass off also and, and the exciting music of it. And, and uh, it's really quite the exception to the rule. So I'm, I'll be... Continuing as a, a searcher of the exception for the exception, and, yeah. But I, I just, I just, there was too much of a, 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 of a, a full, full joyfulness writing t- for me to think that I'm right. going to go find that again in being around too many people and in movies. But like you know, in your relationships with with people in your life that like you talk about Warren Beatty or you know whatever your relationship was, with, you had a relationship with Cassavetes as well, right? Yeah. And Dennis Hopper and these cats who, uh, you know, Terrence Malick, you know, the, you know, Terrence Malick who does, you know, you know, two movies a decade. Right. That you, you, you know, when you talk to them, this older generation of people that have dealt with what you're dealing with, which is, you know, a crisis of, you know, not necessarily a midlife crisis, but what do I do with my creativity if I'm burnt out with this other thing? Mm-hmm. You know, w- what did you learn from those guys? I mean, a lot. It would probably be a very, very long conversation to go back through the, those things that I would, you know, point to. As, but I, but I, I, I'm sure that in in a lot of ways, I searched out those relationships as as in, as much as uh, for the you know the social connections that happened where friendships were made. 
um, uh, as initially f- to, to, to get a sense and get to own a little bit of the anchor of where that thing that they did that made me want to be in movies came from. Yeah. And yes, in, with some of them, I think that they, there, there's a version or another of the disappointment that I have of where things are and in others there aren't. Um, but it's a very hard thing to sustain. Um, you know, we watch a lot of great filmmakers who do continue, uh, and they may still be enjoying it, but they're not making good movies anymore. Uh-huh. Um, and that can come simply because you stop being willing to put the blood on the tracks and what it takes to get a movie made in the first place, to get the money. And who are you talking to? Once upon a time, the heads of studios were movie lovers. They may have you know, been you know, a Thalberg or something like that was essentially a movie lover. Now you've got some business student from Columbia University at 22 years old running the studio and the numbers, and they go to their marketing department before they ever read the script. The marketing department tells them, hey, you can do this up to this much money. Uh, That's what it's going to be worth to you. They come back to the director and they say, here's the money back into it. Yeah. So there's not a lot of time for, for filmmakers to dream and then to fulfill that dream. And most of the films today represent a story rather than make it Mm -hmm. but you got you got one movie in you that you're thinking about i I do have one movie in me that i'm thinking about it's something that you know the affection started before the the uh the uh, divorce of uh between myself and the industry and so i i might have to uh, uh, honor it for myself and for the other people involved oh that's well that's good so it's sort of in in happening kind of i think so i think so and what about like you now the way you talk about love and the way i assume you live your life you know given this there was a funny thing that nolte said about you when they did that prank on you i guess you were on the set of the malik movie where the the jail prank where there was a fight and and, uh, and, you know, he had brought that up that, that, you know, they, they knew this about you, that if you're going to do that, if you're going to bring him to a jailhouse and there's going to be a fight in the next room, you know, Sean's going to go in. Like, there, there's not going to be a second thought. He's going to go in there and deal with it. And you did. And, and then I guess, you know, in retrospect, you, 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 you know, you, you, maybe you appreciated the prank, but you were like, basically said, well, you're lucky I wasn't armed because then there would have been real fucking trouble. No, I didn't say that. Uh, but I did come to think about that particular prank because I, I I enjoy doing pranks myself. <laughs> yeah, is that they they did it very very well. They rehearsed it. They also played on a sympathy because Nick was announcing to me privately for days yeah. that he needed to talk to me because he had cancer. Oh boy, which was not true. Yeah, and so when I found that this my sick friend, who had months to live. Uh, I mean, he'd really sold that to me privately three days earlier in a setup for yeah. this thing. Well, had been arrested for drunk driving. I was down at this police station that was, you know, out in the middle of nowhere in Port Douglas, Australia. Um, and then it, uh, I walked down about seven blocks from where my where my kids were. And I walk into a situation where now the bad guy has taken the gun away from the police officer. Right. And is uh, And it's a big bad guy. And um, they played it beautifully. And the, the thought was, whatever I'm going to do here to try to survive, I may never see my children's faces again. And I decided that I didn't appreciate the prank. <laughs> I think pranks are great when right. they when they act to attack an ego, right. mine or or my victims. Right. But when it when it when it starts scratching at your soul, um, I I, I somehow. Um, you know, don't have a uh, resentment uh, uh-huh. anymore about it. And I certainly got to give them credit. They, they went all the way. Uh, but that was a, that was a notable moment. Uh, well, it seemed to, you know, like in mm-hmm. the, in the, in the, the sort of like uh, chaotic storm that is Nick Nolte's memory, you know, that's, that still features prominently, you know, that like he, he felt bad about it. It seemed, uh, uh-huh. yeah, he, <laughs> No, I don't think he felt that bad about it. Uh, but you know, Nick is a guy. He, he's one. Of, he's one of the significant actors to me. When yeah. I was in high school, and I saw Rich Man Poor Man. Yeah. And Nick Nolte, who was playing a very a high school kid at one point, I think I think he was already in his late thirties, forty or something yeah. like that. He was. It, yeah, that was kind of our generation's James Dean. Hmm. You know, this yeah. guy was just something. I then started going to every Nick Nolte movie, and then ultimately got to work with Nick three or four times. We played brothers in, in, in the theater together, and a Sam Shepard play. And 
Uh, he's he, he's a unique character and a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful actor. But boy, he knows how to beat the shit out of him. So. Well, the, the, <laughs> if, yeah, if you're saying that, <laughs> have you pulled back from that a bit? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, we ha- there's a, you know there's there's only so the body will only let you do so much at a certain point. And what do you when you talk about you know well, I think it's interesting the idea that a prank that scratches at, at the soul where where you know a, you know it should be fun you should be embarrassed it should be like kind of get, give your ego a shot but if you have to you know confront the the the, the dark pain of non existence it's not you know yeah well, knowing that your kids are a couple of blocks away and how they're gonna feel about it and so on you know, those having those thoughts and dreams for a few days didn't make me happy oh. with anybody involved yeah how old are your kids now. 24 and 26. How's that going? That's going great. They're, they're amazing people. They're both acting and modeling. They, uh, you know, an industry that I'm yeah. not very interested in, but, uh, they seem to have fun with it. Are you able to be money. supportive, even though it, it's part of the problem in your eyes? Uh, the, 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 you know, this is one of the hypocrisies uh-huh. that I uh, understand. You know, I, I'm supportive of whatever my kids do that, that uh, keeps them happy and healthy, period. Uh huh. And in terms of, uh, this, the, the challenge of love, you know, in retrospect, you know, what's your wisdom on that? I don't know. I mean, I, I saw you at the, I was backstage briefly at the U2 concert and, and I saw you, but Robin was there. Do you guys get along? We don't have a a, a, a a lot of conversation. Right. Um, you know, we we don't not get along. Right. We, you know, we don't have a very we have very separate relationships with our kids oh. at this point, and it seems to oh, work out they're, better. Oh, they're grown. Right. Better that way. Um, and yeah, because they are making their own decisions, and 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 and, and, and as it turned out, you know, she and I did not like share this the same ethical thought uh, views on on uh, parenting including the continuing parenting of adult children where uh-huh. you know it was better for her to be a, entirely whatever she is and available to them and they love their mother and they have that relationship and for me to be entirely available but also able to not for n- us not to depend on what was always going to be conflicting ethics uh, yeah like around what that yeah, would be getting too okay. much into my kids' personal. Life. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, and 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 where do you stand with the possibility of of you know that love in your life, given that the type of love you appreciate is so you know chaotic and insane and dangerous, or have you mellowed in that way? I'm still, you know, I'm never going to take a position that I close close off to love. I think, you know, people feeling in love with each other is a great, great thing. More and more, I do find that um, the relationships become pretty transactional and and uh, it's, it's very, you know, it's not easy to uh, run into somebody that, uh, you know, makes life better the next day for you to be in, involved with. But I, but if I did, I'd, uh, I'd grab it. So, Okay, so you you you're a bit jaded. Uh, this your word, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what would you say? Protective, uh, cynical. Uh, it, is, it reminds me of uh, um, a woman named Erin Dignam wrote a line in a movie one time where the man says to the woman who's in, in some emotional trouble, he's he's trying to pep her up, and he says, uh, "You know what do you want to do? I mean, you want to go to the beach?" And she says, "I." I've been to the beach. He says, talk about jaded. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, then, was there a period there? Like, because I do, you know, you do spend some time uh, talking or, you know, at least reacting, as you did earlier in our conversation, but to, to the Me Too movement in terms of due process and in terms of victimhood. Uh, but was there, you know, when this started happening, were you scared? Oh, no, no, no. Personally, was yeah. I scared? No, I, you know, I, there, there are differences between, um, you know, I find I have a difference between myself and some of my, my fellow men in, in the sense that it never occurred to me, for example, upon re- being rejected to claim anger over it mm-hmm. or to mistreat the person as a result of it. And and yet you want this thing to teach us something. And as a man, I'm here to tell people in the women's movement, we need help. But it's got to go slow. You know, you're, you're, this this is a lot to unpack overnight. And and I think that what gets missed is things that you don't have to unpack overnight, like equal pay yesterday. Mm-hmm. 
get it done. Yeah. yeah. Um, and no dicks in the workplace, if possible. And uh, uh, don't rape people. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we've always known that. The right. question is, how do you how do you get victims to be able and to report that yeah. when it happens? Right. And those who do are heroes. Yeah. Yeah. And that does take, I mean, that woman that Oprah Winfrey was referring to, uh, uh, in her Golden Globes speech, mm-hmm. at her life's risk, mm. immediately went. And that put, while they didn't get convicted, it put those people on, it put people on notice. Mm-hmm. It put people on notice in Mississippi when Emmett Till's mother said, we're going to go with an open casket and let them see how my son was brutalized at 14 years old. And the, the, that heroism, um, I, I, I would like to see that word saved for that. Somebody's been victimized for something and they can help, whether it's even too late, uh, you know, legally or something, by sharing their story. I'm all for that. But when it comes to the pride of the pack, I get very skeptical. Mm. All right, man. Well, I'm excited about uh, the book. Did a good job. It's compelling. It's engaging. Got to take it. You know, it's a, there's a lot in there, and, and I enjoyed reading it. Uh, I'm excited about Bradley's new movie. <laughs> yeah. And what is it? What What's the one you got uh, percolating? I know we've got a you got an hour here. What's it? What, what What's the angle? What's the world of the new movie that you're thinking about? Oh, well, it's a it's a it, it's from a memoir. Uh, written by a woman whose father was um, one of the biggest counterfeiters in American history, and so relation. So it's a father-daughter relationship.